and they don't welcome him today. In other places, they're like, okay, Holy Spirit, you're going to be a means to an end. We need you to heal the sick. We need you to bring deliverance. But we, the end should be to love him. To love him. He is the one who's going to bring all that. But we don't seek him to get a result. Or we don't seek him because we want an atmosphere. Whether there's an atmosphere, whether there's healings or miracles or not, we want him. Ah, if you only knew him. I want to speak to you tonight about loving the Holy Spirit with all of your heart. He's a person. He's not a thing. He's not an energy. He's not a language. He's not a power. He's a person who's got emotions. The Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks about the love of the Spirit. Oh, if you only knew how much He loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He yearns, the Bible says, for you. He yearns to be with you. He yearns for a relationship with you. It's unbelievable to me when I begin to experience His love because I couldn't believe that someone would love me in that way. Because I knew I was not deserving of that love. I was not deserving of the purity of that love. I was not deserving of unconditional love. But that's the way He is. He loves. Even when you're unfaithful. Even when you fail Him. Even when you ignore Him. He continues to love you. I asked Him one time, Holy Spirit, what are you like? What, I mean, we see the personality of Jesus. We see the personality of the Father. What are you like, Holy Spirit? What is your personality like? And he said to me, you will know me by my fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Above all, he's a person who loves Deeply, deeply, he loves you deeply, radically. Joy. He's a person full of joy. He, he's not a depressed spirit. He's not a sad spirit. He's a joyful spirit. He's full of joy in his presence. There is fullness of joy. He's peaceful. He's patient. He's good. The Bible speaks about a good spirit. He's good and he's, he's just good and merciful. He's kind. And believe it or not, Sometimes you don't see this, but he's gentle. Sometimes he comes with a lot of power, but he's gentle. He knows how to speak to you with gentleness, with kindness. He knows how to lead with gentleness and kindness. That's his personality. The Bible speaks he has a mind. The mind of the Spirit. The Bible says that he speaks. He speaks. He wants to speak to you. He wants to speak. He speaks. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. The Holy Spirit is a person. And He desires for you to love Him. Yes, He wants to give you gifts. But if you seek the gifts, you're going to miss the most important of it all, which is a relationship. Yes, he can heal the sick. Yes, he's got power to raise the dead. 
Yes, he's got power to bring sight to the blind and open deaf ears, but you can leave this place with the miracle and how awesome it is. You're going to miss the greatest blessing of it all to leave this conference with the person as your best friend. To leave with the Holy Spirit in you. To develop the relationship. How do you get to know the Holy Spirit? How do you have a relationship with Him? How do you hear His voice? How are you led by Him? How, how you get to know the Holy Spirit? There was a man that walked on this earth that had the most intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. There was a man that walked on this earth that loved the Holy Spirit. That his whole life depended on the Holy Spirit. That his life was led by the Holy Spirit. There was a man in this world who walked in the Spirit. And the person he loved the most out of everybody was the Holy Spirit. His name was Jesus. Jesus. Jesus loved the Holy Spirit. Jesus trusted the Holy Spirit. Jesus desired to be with the Holy Spirit. Yes, he had friends. He had three intimate friends. Peter, James, and John. Yes, he loved to hang out with his 12 disciples. Yes, he had 70 evangelists that he sent out. And yes, there was multitudes of people who followed him. But out of everybody, he loved to be with the Holy Spirit the most. He would just run away and just go to the mountain. Why? Because he loved the Holy Spirit. Through the life of Jesus, we can learn how to develop our own intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Our desire should be to be disciples of Jesus, to learn from Jesus, to follow Jesus, to imitate Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want to walk like Jesus. And I need the Holy Spirit to transform me into His image. I need the Holy Spirit to make me like Jesus, to make me kind, gentle, loving, good like Jesus. I want to be like Him. Holy Spirit, transform me into His image. Write His laws upon my heart. Holy Spirit, I need you. Help me. He's your helper, the Bible says. Jesus, He longed for the day that he was going to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us he went to the Jordan River and he was baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. And he showed us the way to encounter the Holy Spirit. You want to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit tonight? Jesus is showing you the way. First, he was baptized in water. What does baptism in water represent? It's repentance of sin. You cannot have an encounter with the Holy Spirit unless you first repent from your sins. He is holy. And for Him to come dwell in you, you need to be cleansed and washed by the blood of Jesus. And you're cleansed and washed and forgiven when you repent from sin. What does repentance mean? It means that you've died to the lifestyle. It means that you turn away from wicked ways. It means that you no longer practice sin. But if your hand causes you to sin, you cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, you pluck it out. You make a conscious decision to change and to turn away from your sinful ways. Water baptism 
means that you are identifying with the death of Jesus on the cross. I no longer live, but Christ lives with it lives in me. Water baptism, true repentance is I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And this life that I now live in the flesh, I live through faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You need to die. Crucify, the Bible says, the desires of your flesh. You need to crucify it. It doesn't mean you need to tame it. It doesn't mean that you need to keep it on the side. No, you need to cut it off. True repentance comes through the conviction of the Spirit. And true repentance brings freedom, brings newness, newness of life. John the Baptist said, I baptize you in water for repentance. The water baptism doesn't mean anything if you don't repent. It's the same thing as you jumping in a swimming pool. That's not going to save you. It's not going to cleanse you. The only thing that cleanses you is the blood of Jesus. And he cleanses you when you repent of your sins. And then you get water baptized to testify to the world that you've been crucified with Christ. You no longer live, but now Christ lives in you. So August 25th, Hungry Gen is going to have a water baptism. If you haven't been baptized in water and you want to follow Jesus in his example, you want to know the Holy Spirit, show up and say, I want to follow Jesus' example. I am willing to repent of my sins because I want to follow Jesus. Jesus was baptized. Then he prayed. The question is, what did he pray? He prayed for what he received. Because when Jesus prayed, God gave him what he prayed for. So he prayed for the heavens to be opened. And he prayed to receive the Holy Spirit. And he taught his own disciples, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Which one of you, being, if us being bad, we know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more will your Father who's in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You must pray and ask and knock and seek and the heaven's door will be opened upon your life and he will pour his spirit upon your heart. He will pour his love upon your heart. There's a gate on top of your head. It's the gate of heaven. And there's a gate under your feet. It's the gates of hell. You determine what's going to impact or influence your life. You want your life to be influenced by heaven or you want your life to be influenced by hell? When you repent, the gates of hell shut that under your feet. And when you pray, the gates of heaven open over your head. When you forgive, those who abuse you, those who reject you, those who mistreat you, when you forgive your enemies and you love them, you pray for them, you bless them, and you don't condemn them, you don't judge them, but you show mercy like your Father is merciful, those gates shut under your feet. And God's open heaven over your life. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit came on the Jordan River in the form of a dove. He could have picked any animal on the world, but he picked a dove. Jesus identifies with the lion and the lamb. He's a lion and he's a lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Holy Spirit is like a dove. 
Doves are prey animals. So people, uh, all the animals prey on them. So they're constantly skittish. They're very, they get scared, they, they get spooked away very easily. They're very gentle. And probably none of you have ever had a dove just fly on its own and land on your shoulder. You know why? Because they don't trust you. They don't trust you. Why they don't trust you? Because they think you may be a predator. When I was little, I had pigeons, which are kind of like doves, same family. And when you spend time with pigeons, you get to realize that each one of them has their own little personality. And the more time you spend with them, they begin to trust you. They begin to trust you. Like they, they, they begin to realize he's not a predator. I can trust this man. And there's no... It's a very unique feeling when you walk into the loft, they're called lofts, and a bird on its own just comes flying and lands on your shoulder. You know that bird trusts you, that you're not going to harm it, that you're not going to wound it, that you're not going to kill it, that you're not going to eat it. He trusts you, and he comes and lands on your shoulder. The Holy Spirit trusted his heart to Jesus. He's very easily grieved. All sins are forgiven. Blasphemy against God, against Jesus. But if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you're never going to be forgiven. Why? Because his heart is special. It's special. And he only comes upon those whom he can trust. Are you a person that the Holy Spirit can trust? Can he trust you not to wound him? Can he trust you with his secrets? Can he trust you with his ways? Can he trust you revealing himself to you? He trusted Jesus. And he came and he filled Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus was filled with the Spirit and then he was led by the Holy Spirit. So now Jesus trusts the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit trusted Jesus. Now Jesus trusts the Holy Spirit with his life. He follows him into a desert. You got to trust somebody to take you to a place like a desert. And the Holy Spirit took him to a place where they could be alone. Alone. Because if you want to know the Holy Spirit, there's only one place, and that is alone. Yes, conferences are awesome. You can encounter the Holy Spirit here, but you're not going to get to know Him here. Yes, going to church is awesome, but you're not going to get to know Him there. You get to know Him when you shut the door and you're alone with Him. Just you and Him, nobody else. He yearns for you. He wants to draw you to that place to be alone with Him. No distractions, no noises, no people, no social media, no television, no, uh, no gossip, no slander, no, just you and Him. This is a dangerous place to be. 
Nobody likes to be alone. Why? Because when you're alone, that's when the devil attacks. The devil is like a roaring lion looking for him to devour, and he attacks those who are alone. It's like, like lions when they hunt, they look for the weak prey that's on its own, it's alone, and they go for that one. So when you're alone, suddenly the enemy begins to attack you. He begins to attack you. He begins to lie to you. He brings to begin to bring condemnation, guilt, shame. He begins to attack your identity. See, when Jesus was baptized, the Father said, you are my beloved Son, and I am pleased with you. And then the enemy comes and says, if you are the Son of God, you're not the Son of God. You're not loved. You're not accepted. He doesn't truly love you. He's not for you. Look, he took you to a desert to kill you. Liar and father of all lies. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Bible says, he gives testimony to your spirit that you are a son and a daughter of God. The Holy Spirit not only convicts of sin, he convicts you of righteousness. He convicts you that you're forgiven, that you're righteous, that you, you're holy. <laughs> that you are loved. That you are accepted. But here comes the enemy with his lies. Nobody loves you. God doesn't love you. You're not accepted. You're not good enough. But Jesus discerned between the voice of his father and the voice of the enemy. And he chose to believe the voice of the father. And he learned to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's a gentle, still, small voice. The enemy had no hold on him. And he came out of the desert in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he went to Nazareth and the first sermon he preached, the first four words that he said, the Spirit of the Lord. His first sermon was about the Holy Spirit. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I am not alone. There's someone who's upon me, and his name is the Spirit of the Lord. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And then he said, he has anointed me for a reason, for a purpose to preach good news good news. We're carriers of good news, of great news. No news of condemnation, of, condemn, of, of, of guilt, of shame. No, we're carriers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That through faith in his sacrifice on the cross, through faith in Jesus and through repentance from sin, you can be forgiven, you can be free, you can be healed, you can be set free, and you can have eternal life. It's a gift. It's a gift. Eternity. Eternity as a gift. Good news. What do I have to do? Believe. In Jesus, believe to heal the brokenhearted. Oh, the Holy Spirit is the only one who can heal the broken heart. In this world, your heart will be broken. I read the other day there's two things that are for sure in this world. For sure. One is that you're gonna die, and two is that you're gonna be rejected. 
that's going to hurt. And there's no pill you could take. There's no medicine you can take. But the Holy Spirit can come. And he heals the brokenhearted. He heals the brokenhearted. I was ministering and I like to tell this story because it's very, it's very um, graphical. I was ministering in Austin, in, in Texas one day. And after the service, we were praying in the altar. And I come up to this girl and she's crying, crying, crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, I don't want to live anymore. And she lifts her sleeves and she's got scars where she's cut herself. She would cut herself. She's got scars of cutting herself. She said, I don't want to live anymore. I asked her, who do you need to forgive? And she said, my father. I said, are you ready to forgive him? She said, yes. She forgave her father, the gates of hell shut. The windows of heaven opened. She fell under the power of the Holy Spirit and she was on the floor. We kept praying for many hours. We were finished with the pastor walking out of the church. It was late at night. I turned around and she was still at the altar crying. I got in my car, started driving to Houston. It's like a three-hour drive or something like that. Halfway through, the pastor calls me. He said, Andres, you won't believe what happened. That girl, when she stood up, her face changed. And she went home, and when she began to change to go to bed, she looked at the scars, and they had disappeared from her arms. <laughs> Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. To set the captives free and hear hungry Jen, you know that's true. You know he, he, he's got power. Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of the Lord, then you know the kingdom of God has come upon you. He casted out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit. To give sight to the blind, to heal the sick. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The power of the Holy Spirit can do all things. And Jesus began to walk in the Spirit. And the Bible says that people just simply touched him and power went out from him and healed them all. What was the power that came out of Jesus? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the same power that's present here tonight. To heal all. What do I have to do? Touch Jesus. And if you touch Jesus through faith, the Holy Spirit will touch you tonight. And since he is an all-knowing person, he knows every one of your needs. You don't have to tell me or a preacher or a prayer person. He knows what you need. And if you touch Jesus, he will touch you where your need is. He will restore your health. And Jesus, on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, he stood up and he cried out. He cried out. From the depths of his soul, he cried out, if any one of you thirsts, let him come to me. Come to me, Jesus was saying, and drink. And he who believes out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He spoke this concerning the spirit that those who believe in him would receive. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the last day of the Feast of the Tabernacles was October 7th, where the massacre took place in Israel. where Hamas went into Israel and killed over a thousand innocent lives, tortured them and killing them. And I believe that when Jesus cried out, he could see that day. He could see that day coming. And if you watch the videos 
in that music festival, all these young people were dancing and there was a huge statue of a Buddha. All these young people, thirsty, thirsty, thirsty for something, looking for something. And Jesus said, come to me. Come to me, Jesus says. That idol cannot give you what you're looking for. Drugs cannot give you what you're looking for. Alcohol cannot give it to you. Perversion will not give it to you. Jesus stands up and cries out, if you are thirsty, come to me. And I will give you to drink living water. Rivers will flow from your innermost being. Jesus not only walked in the Spirit, was filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, but he preached about the Holy Spirit. And right before he was crucified, his last message to his disciples, when he began to open his heart to his close disciples, he began to speak about the Holy Spirit. You know when you're about to die, your last message to those who love, those who you love, are going to be the most important things you're ever going to tell them. And Jesus told them, it is to your advantage. It is better for you that I leave. And you're like, what? What do you mean, Jesus? How can it be better for us that you leave? He says, because I want to leave with you the comforter, the spirit of truth. He says, the people in this world cannot receive him because they neither know him nor see him. But you know him because he's with you. He's been with you all this time. But now, he's going to be inside of you. He's going to be inside of you. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. The Holy Spirit is God in us. And this is the mystery. Hidden for generations, but tonight is revealed to us. He's saints, Christ in us. See, the Holy Spirit is not only with you or upon you. He's within you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, that's why it's an advantage for you that I go. Because every one of you is going to go home and the Holy Spirit is going to go home with you. Not with you, but in you. He says, He will convict the world of sin. He will show you things to come. He will glorify me. The Holy Spirit only glorifies Jesus. He doesn't glorify a man or a ministry. He glorifies Jesus. He will testify of me. He will reveal me to people. He will show you things to come. He will remind you of what I've said. Jesus telling him, this is going to be awesome. The spirit of truth. I'm not going to leave you an orphan. I'm not going to leave you alone. You're not going to be an orphan. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to be in you. And Jesus was crucified. The third day, he rose from the dead. And he appeared to his disciples in his first message once again on the Holy Spirit. He said to them, peace be with you. They were scared. They were afraid. They thought they were going to die. They were under persecution. They thought they killed Jesus. Now they're going to kill us. They were locked in this room. And Jesus appears to them and says, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He said, the same way the Father sent me, now I'm sending you into the world. But I'm not sending you alone. I'm not sending you in your power and your wisdom. I'm sending someone to be with you. I'm sending a person to guide you, to strengthen you, to comfort you. To, oh, I'm sending you the one I loved the most. The one I trusted my life to. The one who never failed me. I'm leaving with you the Holy Spirit. And he breathed. <sighs> and then on the last day on earth, before he left, 
once again, his message was on the Holy Spirit. He said, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Don't go on your own. Don't do it on your own strength. Wait, wait, wait for the promise. Welcome the promise. However he comes, it's not up to us to decide. It's not for us to make a doctrine. He's a person. He can do what he wants. They didn't know he was going to come like a mighty rushing wind. They didn't know he was going to come like tongues of fire. But he came as a mighty rushing wing, as a tongues. They thought they were going to be doves coming from heaven. But he came like fire. And they were drunk. I was like, what? What is this? We don't want this in the church. Imagine the pastor of the upper room. All these people are drunk. Get him out of here. We don't want this. This is disruptive. This is offensive to people. People are not going to want to come. This is going to offend people. Put him in the back room. The Holy Spirit came. And you know why he came like that? Because he was excited. He was excited. He was like, let's do it, man. Let's do this. Let's take this gospel to the ends of the earth. Let's do it. The Holy Spirit got a little too excited on Pentecost. He got everybody drunk. He got everybody on fire. And the same Peter who just denied Jesus three times stood up and preached the gospel. And there came conviction of sin and there came repentance. And he said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be baptized. And you too, you too can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children. See, the promise is not just to you, but it's also to your children. First message Peter preached on the Holy Spirit. I wonder who he learned from. And today, we don't want to talk about him. I've been to places where they're like, don't preach on the Holy Spirit. They literally told me that. Don't speak in tongues. Don't lay hands on people. I had all these restraints put on me. Don't take testimonies. And Peter began to walk in the streets of Jerusalem and his shadow will go over the sick. And every single one of them was healed. All. All. Some people say, oh, that was for Jesus to heal all. But here we see Peter doing the same thing Jesus did, healing all. But it wasn't the shadow of Peter. It was someone who was upon Peter. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. To preach good news, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to bring healing to the sick. And revival broke out in Jerusalem. I don't know if you've ever been to Jerusalem, but I've been to many countries in the world. And if you think there's one city that it's impossible for revival to break out, it's Jerusalem. The amount of religiosity, the depth of the knowledge of the Jewish people of scriptures is scary. The devotion that they have to the Word of God, the devotion that they have to their religion, to their faith, they're willing to die for their faith. The amount of hours that they spent studying the Scriptures and praying at the Western Wall, you're like, there's no way these people could ever. I mean, it, it seems impossible, but when the Holy Spirit is there, He convicts and He reveals. And he takes the blinders off. And he says, He's the Messiah. And the Jews were saved by the thousands. By the thousands, the Jews were being saved. It wasn't theology. 
It wasn't doctrine. It was, we, I'm telling you, you would never beat a, a rabbi on your knowledge of scriptures. You will never convince him through knowledge. You will never convince him through scripture. Only the Holy Spirit can open the eyes of the blind. And I could keep going all night because then we see Paul and we see Ananias laying his hands on Saul and Saul being filled with the Holy Spirit. And Saul saying, when I went to you, I did not preach with human wisdom and, and with beautiful words and eloquence. When I went to you, I preached Jesus and Jesus crucified. And my message was not eloquent or was not with a lot of wisdom or revelation. It was in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. So that your faith was not in the eloquence or knowledge of men, but in the power of God. The beautiful thing is that the same Holy Spirit is here tonight. He wants to fill you tonight. He wants to empower you. He wants to he wants you to leave this place knowing that he's in you.